this presentation, we will learn how to use T procedures to compare the mean of a variable across two independent samples. We will also discuss the conditions that we have to meet to conduct this procedure and some of the things that we have to take into account when interpreting the results. In many research situations, we want to compare two independent groups. With matched samples, we test the same individuals twice, or we test pairs of individuals who are very similar in some respect, like twins, for instance. When we work with independent samples, the two groups of individuals are randomly selected from two different populations. The term independent is used because the individuals in one sample must be completely unrelated to the individuals in the other sample. This could be the case when we want to see if a certain variable, like test scores on a certain subject area, are significantly different between males and females. In such a situation, we must randomly select a group of females and then randomly select a group of males. We have two groups and they come from two separate populations, a population of females and a population of males. Each one of these populations has a mean on that variable. The notation for the two population means is mu1 and mu2. The actual means that we compute from the two samples are labeled with x bar, so we have x bar 1 and x bar 2. For the number of individuals in the two samples, we have the notation n1 and n2. Before conducting any statistical analysis, we must make sure that we meet two assumptions. The first one is that the two samples were randomly selected and are independent from one another. The second assumption is that the variable that we're measuring has a normal distribution in both populations. However, in the sample, the distribution does not have to be perfectly normal. Usually, if we have a symmetric distribution and there are no strong outliers, we can use t-procedures to make inferences. In this type of analysis, we are interested in making inferences about the difference between two groups, between females and males. We can either compute a confidence interval for this difference or test whether the difference between the two groups is statistically significant. Because we don't know the two population means, mu1 and mu2, we use the sample means to make these inferences. So we are making inferences about the difference x1 minus x2. But to conduct any of these procedures, we must also know the standard deviation of this difference in the population. The formula for the population standard deviation of the difference can be obtained by dividing the squared standard deviation of each population by the sample size adding the results of the two divisions, and then taking the square root of the sum. However, we can only compute this if we know the standard deviations in the population, or the sigmas, of the two populations. So, this is the formula that we would use with the Z procedures. However, most of the times, we don't know the population standard deviations, so we will use the T procedures to make inferences. In this case, we estimate the standard error of the difference using the standard deviations of the samples. So the standard error of the mean difference between the two groups can be obtained simply by replacing sigma with S in the formula. So for each sample, we divide the squared of the sample standard deviation by the sample size, we add the results of the two divisions, and then we take the square root of the sum. We already know that the shape of the t-distribution is different for different sample sizes. Therefore, when making inferences about the difference between two population means, we must take into account the size of the two samples, because we use the t-distribution to make these inferences. The degrees of freedom show the sample size. 
when we are using technology, the degrees of freedom are computed for us using a more complicated formula. When doing calculations by hand, we compute the degrees of freedom for each sample by subtracting one from the sample size, and we use the degrees of freedom that is the smallest, so the degrees of freedom from the smaller sample. In some situations, we need to estimate a confidence interval for the difference between the two groups. To obtain this confidence interval, all we have to do is to compute the difference between the two sample means, and then add and subtract the margin of error to obtain the upper and the lower limits of this interval. The margin of error is obtained by multiplying the standard error by t star. T star can be obtained from table C in the textbook, based on the confidence level that we desire, and the degrees of freedom. Or, we could use software to compute this confidence interval. Let's look at an example of how to estimate a confidence interval for the difference between two groups. Let's say that we would like to know what the difference is in the population between females and males' performance on a certain test. To be able to make an inference about the difference between the two populations, we must select a random sample from the population of females and a random sample from the population of males. Although we use separate selection procedures for the two groups, we don't need to have two separate data sets. Individuals from both samples are included in the same data file. As illustrated in the table, for each individual we enter an identifier and the value of the variable that we are interested in, which is test for here. We must, however, have a categorical variable which shows to which group every individual belongs to. In this example, the categorical variable is gender. The value 1 is used for females and the value 2 is used to designate males. This is called our grouping variable because it shows to which group or to which random sample every individual belongs to. In order to make inferences about the difference between the two groups in the population, we need to know the sample size, the mean, and the standard deviation of each group. In this example, there are 8 females. Their mean test score was 97.25, and the standard deviation for this group was 3.65. The male group includes 12 individuals, has a mean of 87.25, and a standard deviation of 9.6. These statistics can easily be obtained using statistical software. In fact, we don't have to conduct a separate descriptive analysis to obtain them. They're automatically computed when we estimate a confidence interval or conduct a test of significance. The group statistics table is the part of the SPSS output that provides this information. We can already see from the descriptive results that the mean for female is 10 points higher than the mean for males. However, if we selected another two random samples of females and males, the numbers would be slightly different. Therefore, instead of providing just one difference, we must compute a confidence interval for this difference. Let's say that we want to estimate with 90% confidence the difference in test scores in the population between females and males. If we want to estimate this confidence interval using statistical software, the results will be slightly different than if we do this by hand. Statistical software uses a more complicated formula to compute the degrees of freedom and tests for the assumption that the variance of the variable is equal in the two populations. Because this assumption is almost never met, in this class we will use the results of the second row in the SPSS output table. The mean difference column in this table shows the difference between the average test score for females and the average test score for males, which is 10 points.
The 90% confidence interval is provided in the last two columns of the table. We can see there that the lower limit of the interval is 4.64 and the upper limit is 15.36. These results indicate that females typically score higher than males on this test, and in 90% of the cases, this difference is somewhere between 4.64 and 15.36 points. This interval is quite large, and this is because our samples are so small. I chose these samples just to ease the computation process, but in reality, we should not estimate a confidence interval with such small samples. If we want to compute a confidence interval by hand, all we have to know is the size of the two samples and the mean and standard deviation for each group. The degrees of freedom will be equal to 7. Our smallest group has 8 individuals, and if we subtract 1 from 8, we get 7. For a 90% confidence level and 7 degrees of freedom, the value of T star is 1.833. This value comes from table C on the last page of the textbook. If we replace all these values in the formula for the confidence interval, we obtain a lower limit of 4.65 and an upper limit of 15.34. These values are very close to the ones provided by SPSS. The small differences between these values are due to rounding and to the different procedure of computing the degrees of freedom. In many research situations, we need to test whether the difference between two independent groups of individuals is statistically significant. The null hypothesis for this test is that the two populations have equal means, or that in the population there is no significant difference between the average scores of the two groups. The alternative hypothesis can be one-sided, stating that the mean of one group is higher or lower than the mean of the other group, or if we have no information that would justify a one-sided alternative hypothesis, we can formulate a two-sided alternative hypothesis, which states that the two means are just different. The test statistic T is actually a standardized difference between the means of the two samples. You can see that the numerator of the formula is actually the difference between the two sample means. And we divide this difference by its standard error, which we already learned how to compute. Like with any other test of significance, after the test statistic is computed, we must determine whether this test statistic is far enough from zero to reject the null hypothesis. And we can do this either by using software or by hand using table C. Let's use the same data to test whether the difference between females and males average test scores is statistically significant. For this example, the null hypothesis is that in the population, there is no significant difference in average test scores between females and males. Because we cannot anticipate which group will have higher scores, our alternative hypothesis is two-sided and states that in the population there is a statistically significant difference in average test scores between females and males. If we use SPSS to conduct this test of significance, results are provided in the independent samples test table in the section labeled t-test for equality of means along with a confidence interval for the difference between the two means. We can see there that the test statistic T is equal to 3.27. It is a positive value which shows that the female average score is larger than the male's average score. The two-sided p-value is 0.005. Because the alternative hypothesis was two-sided, we can use this value as is.
when the alternative hypothesis is one-sided, we should divide its value by 2. As usual, our significance level, alpha, is 0.05. The p-value for this test statistic was smaller than alpha, therefore we should reject the null hypothesis. If we have to explain these results in writing, we should say that if the null hypothesis is true, that is, if the two population means are truly equal, there is only a 0.5% probability of obtaining an average difference of 10 points between the two samples. Because this probability is smaller than alpha, then we should reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis that the difference between the two population means is statistically significant. If we conduct the tests of significance by hand, we just need to know the sample size, the mean, and the standard deviation of each sample. If we replace these values in the formula for the test statistic, for our example, we obtain a t-score of 3.43. The value obtained by hand differs somewhat than the value provided by SPSS due to rounding error. The other thing that we have to do is to find the critical value of p that corresponds to our degrees of freedom, we have 7 degrees of freedom, and the significance level of 0 0.05. Remember that our alpha is two-sided because the null hypothesis was two-sided. So the critical value that we find in table C for these values is 2.365. Our test statistic, which was 3.43, is greater than the critical value. Therefore, we should reject the null hypothesis. Of course, the interpretation of the results is the same as if we use software. Only the evidence that we provide to support our decision is different. T-procedures with two samples are more robust to non-normality than the one-sample T-method. In general, the condition of having randomly selected samples is more important than the shape of the distribution. Also, we must make sure that we have an adequate sample size. When the two sample sizes add up to less than 15 individuals, we can only use the t-procedures if the distribution is close to normal. However, when the samples are large, the t-procedures can be used even when the distribution is not normal, if there are no strong outliers. In this presentation, we discussed how to make inferences about two population means using t-procedures for independent samples. We showed how to estimate a confidence interval for the mean difference between two populations and how to test whether this difference is statistically significant. We have also discussed the conditions that we have to meet to conduct these procedures and the robustness of T-procedures to the violation of these assumptions.